Hi, my name is Samir Mather and I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I completed my med school at the University of Pennsylvania. Subsequently, I went on to do an orthopedic residency and then a spine surgery fellowship at Rush Hospital in Chicago. Uh, I then worked as an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, in spine surgery for several years, and now I'm practicing at Cary Orthopedics since 2010. Uh, my focus of spine surgery is minimally invasive spine surgery. Um, today I'm going to discuss some of the reasons why we do uh, lumbar fusion surgery. There's multiple reasons, but three of the most common reasons why we do uh, lumbar fusion surgery is spondylolisthesis, that means that one of your bones has shifted out of place, or if you have a scoliosis, and the third reason is degenerative disc disease. I'm going to go through each of these causes, explain to you why we need to do a fusion, and then uh, go over exactly how we do uh, a posterior lumbar fusion technique. The most common reason why I do a lumbar fusion is if you have spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis means that there's slippage of the vertebra bone in relation to the other bone. So if you look at this animated model, you can see that this bone here has slipped forward in relation uh, to the bone here. This is what we call a spondylolisthesis. As this bone here has shifted forward, you can see that it compresses the nerve as a nerve is leaving to go down into the legs. And this can result in back pain and nerve pain as well. So spondylolisthesis is the most common reason why I perform a lumbar fusion. Another reason to do a lumbar fusion is when a patient has a scoliosis. Scoliosis means that there's curvature of the spine. As you can see, this is a spine that's straight. And over time, you can develop scoliosis. And you can see now that there's this curvature of the spine uh, throughout the lower part of the lumbar spine and extending up into the thoracic spine where the ribs are. So when you have this condition and the curvature degree has exceeded a certain amount and or if you're having leg pain, numbness, tingling, or weakness, we have to address the scoliosis surgically and we have to do a lumbar fusion. Another reason why we do lumbar fusion is degenerative disc disease. You can see in this animation that these are the vertebral bodies, and in between these vertebral bodies are these discs. And these discs are the shock absorbers of the spine. They absorb the pressure when you're bending, twisting, running, jumping, so the bones don't see the pressure. These are pictures of a healthy disc. Over time, the disc can degenerate, and as it degenerates, the disc collapses, and you can have a decrease in the height. So this is a characteristic of a disc. This is called the annulus, which is the outside of the disc. And this annulus is the bands that keep this nucleus, which is a jelly, in place. Over time, these bands can have a fracture or a crack in them, and then scar tissue replaces these bands. But the scar tissue is never as healthy or as strong as the initial bands. And this can lead to degeneration of the disc this inner part, which is the nucleus pulposus, which is a jelly-like material. Once the degenerative cascade starts, eventually the height of the disc decreases, as you can see here, and the bones are closer together than they should be. Once the bones are closer together, the facet joints, which are the joints in the back, rotate abnormally, and now stress is increased in these joints, and arthritis or degeneration of this joint occurs. Once this happens, you can then get compression of the nerves from the bone spurs that are formed in these joints. So once the disc starts to degenerate, you get circumferential degenerative changes. The disc is degenerating, which is leading to further stress in the facet joints, which then causes degeneration of the facet. Um, these are all pain mediators that can result in back pain and eventually pain radiating into the lower extremities. To treat this pathology, we have to perform a fusion, um, which I will go through of how to technically do that. In a fusion, what our goal is, is to take two vertebrae that are moving abnormally and causing pain and fuse them together. And the idea is, once these vertebrae are not moving abnormally, then we're removing the pressure from the disc that's degenerative. We're also taking pressure off the joints, which are the facet joints that I showed you earlier. And by not having abnormal motion, the pain is better, and it also decompresses the nerves as well. So our goal is to fuse one vertebral body to the vertebral body below it. 
when we perform the surgery, the, the patient is on their stomach. We identify which levels we have to treat. We mark that under x-ray on the skin where the levels are. After we make the skin incision, we encounter the muscles. In a minimally invasive technique, we dissect the muscle off of the bones um, that create the spinal canal. Once we minimally invasively dissect the muscles, we are then looking at the spinal canal and the spinal lamina. So here are the laminas here and here. These are the spinous processes that are the tips of the spine that you can feel when you touch your back. In this illustration, you can see that these joints, which are the facet joints, are arthritic and there's bone spurs. The disc in the front is degenerative and this is leading to significant amount of back pain and nerve mediated pain with the compression of the nerve here. Our goal here is to decompress the nerve and then stabilize the spine. The first step in this surgery is performing the laminectomy. So as a review, this bone here is the lamina and this is the spinous process. So we remove this bone, which is the spinous process, and then we remove the lamina. As we remove this lamina, now we open up the spinal canal where there's more room for the nerves to travel down the canal. The next step is then to do a foraminotomy where we then remove the bone from the areas of the facet joints here. And we can see that using special instruments, we remove the bone spurs, which then takes pressure off of the nerves here and here that are traveling down into the legs, which relieves leg pain, weakness, numbness, and tingling. After relieving the pressure on the nerves, we then prepare the area where we're going to do the fusion. The, marked in red are the bones that we want to fuse together. So the next step that we do after we identify the region that we want to fuse, which is this region here and this region here, we place our instrumentation. So under navigation, we place the screws into the vertebral body. We subsequently put a rod connecting this screw to the screw below it. And then we put what we call a set screw to ensure that the rod does not come out from the pedicle screw that we've placed. After placing the instrumentation, we place bone graft around these screws and over the bones here. The bone graft that we put is from cadaver or bone. We usually don't take any bone from your hip unless we have to. Um, here are the screws that we showed in the animation, and here is the rod and the set screws um, that we've placed. And as you can see, these screws go into the bone here, and the spinal cord is in the middle, so this is a safe placement of the screws. After the surgery is done, we take uh, you to the recovery room. Uh, depending on how many levels we do, you're normally in the hospital for 24 to 48 hours. Our goal is to mobilize you as quickly as possible with physical therapy. You see us back in about 10 days after surgery. At that point, we involve you in an outpatient physical therapy program and gradually start returning you back to your activities of daily living. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a registered nurse here at Care Orthopedic Spine Specialist. I'm with Dr. Mather. I'm one of his nurses here. And next time you come in to see us for your last appointment prior to surgery, I'll be speaking with you about your spinal procedure. In the following slides, you will learn about spine surgery education, the risks, recovery, and frequently asked questions. First off, we have the general risks of spine surgery. These risks are quoted with our own office with Dr. Mather, usually less than a 1% chance. Um, we have infection, bleeding, paralysis, blood clots, persistent pain, dural tear, and anesthesia complications. A dural tear is a nick in a spinal cord sac that the spinal cord lives in, almost like a water balloon. If that is punctured in surgery, typically we can see that happen. Um, fluid leaks out, cerebral spinal fluid, and it is then given a patch during the surgery. Um, that would keep you overnight. We would monitor you and watch it the next day. That is actually the highest risk on this list. Um, again, it is probably less than a 1-2% to chance within our office here with Dr. Mather, um, giving them all a low percentage rate. So we have some questions that are very standard here. Um, anytime we have people come in for spine surgery, we put the top 10 together. So here is that list. When can I drive? Uh, we definitely prefer you don't drive until after your first post-operative appointment. That's usually because of pain medications, possible weakness uh, before surgery that lingers after surgery, and just your strength in general. Position for sleeping is always on your back or your side. 
Um, if it's a cervical surgery, a neck surgery, we want you on your back or your side still, but then we also want you elevated. That will help reduce the swelling. Some people do actually require a brace for surgery. It's gonna depend on the surgery itself and um, the mechanism of your surgery. Will I be in pain after surgery? Yes, you will be in pain after surgery. Typically at the incision site is most common. Sometimes residual pain from um, your prior symptoms are still present as well. We hope that there is some relief immediately, but that's not always the case. Returning to work is very different for everybody. It's gonna depend on which exact surgery you're having and then also the job requirements pertaining to it. Do I need supplies for my incision? Yes, you will need supplies. So most commonly you're gonna need gauze and tape. Each incision is just covered with gauze and tape when you leave the hospital and you actually won't change that incision until your first shower, and which is the next question, which is standardly about three days. Um, if you would look at that on the slide, it says you may also use Tegaderm with gauze. Tegaderm is a fancy type of tape that um, a lot of doctors use. We like to use it as well. It's a great use of tape. It can be expensive, so if you can find it at a reasonable price, it is worth getting. Also, island dressings. Island dressings are great as well because it comes with the gauze already attached. It looks like a big white band-aid. We talked about the showering. We do prefer three days. Um, some cases you'll have to wait five days, but we would talk specifically with you at your appointment about that. You do need to change your dressing, but only at shower day. So um, at day three, you will take a shower, take your bandage off first, take your first shower, and then put a clean dressing on after that with your supplies that you had bought previously. When can I be intimate with my partner? Uh, generally, we suggest about six weeks. Will I need physical therapy? In most cases, yes. Again, this is one of those questions that is just going to be pertinent to your specific surgery and recovery. Posterior lumbar fusion surgery. So along with these risks, the other risk slide that was the general risks of surgery, they still go along with the posterior lumbar fusion. These are just the specific ones that are pertaining to the lumbar fusion as well. Uh, nerve injury. This is primarily um, for foot drop, if you've ever heard that term before. Some of the nerves in your low back very much control our ankle motion, which help us walk. Sometimes um, during surgery, the nerve can be injured. It's not a cut or um, a true trauma to the nerve. What it is is when we do a slide mechanism motion in surgery, sometimes that will just kind of hinder the nerve a little bit because we're touching it. And as you know, with the pain that you're probably experiencing right now, nerves don't like to be touched so when we touch it for a long amount of time to move it out of our way to proceed with surgery for you sometimes that will bother it sometimes that can cause some weakness in the ankle that we would just need physical therapy for up front hardware failure we talked about this in the first slide as well for the um, general risks of surgery but again for posterior lumbar fusion hardware failure can happen that would be a screw backing out we give you certain guidelines during your visit to make sure that we prevent this as best we can. Adjacent segment degeneration. Also, this is just putting applied pressure uh, to the vertebrae above and below the fusion process. Cadaver bone, which is dead donated bone. This poses a risk for uh, transmitted disease. This is actually uh, more of a medical theory. Uh, there's never been a documented case that we are aware of that has posed a transmitted disease through cadaver bone. Really the biggest risk of cadaver bone would be the non-union. We actually use cadaver bone along with your own bone to help uh, grow the fusion process quicker for you and more stabilizing in the future. Posterior lumbar fusion. So this is post-operative care and recovery. These are the top highlights for after lumbar fusion surgery. This is kind of like your information on what's coming after surgery. This is not a bed rest procedure. We encourage walking and frequent position changes. If you lay in bed all night and lay in bed all day, you will be so stiff, you will be unable to get up. So it's super important that you rest at nighttime, try and get as much sleep as you can overnight, and then in the morning and throughout the day, you're up and you're moving around. In the first few weeks, this just looks like moving around the house, um, going from your bed to the kitchen, to the couch, to the chair, all those positions are fine. Sitting, standing, walking, all of those things are encouraged in those first few weeks. Sitting for any one long period of time or standing any long period of time, either one of those um, can be detrimental just for pain purposes and also for stiffness. 
You can return to your normal diet as long as it's tolerated. As long as you're not sick from anesthesia, you can eat and drink as needed. For this procedure, it does require a back brace. Um, this is to be worn while you were up greater than 10 minutes. So, which means that if you're at night sleeping, which you do not sleep with the back brace on, but when you're sleeping and you get up to go to the bathroom at night, you don't have to fuss with your brace getting that on uh, just to go to the bathroom. Just get up slowly, go to the bathroom, and then return to your bed is totally fine. Also, we do ask that you wear your brace while riding in the car. It's not gonna prevent an injury, but it certainly will help support you on your car ride. You can use ice to help with the pain as well. Please, no heat. Most commonly, you're gonna have that low back pain right at that incision site. Do not take any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs until advised. Sometimes this can last four to six months. Um, if you have severe arthritis and are on these types of daily medications, we will work with you and get you back on those sooner. These include ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Celebrex, Naproxen. You do not need to change your dressing until you take your first shower, which is about three days later. Take your dressing off, take your first shower, and then put a new dressing back on it. Please do not use any lotions, oils, creams, medications on your incision for at least six weeks. No lifting greater than 20 pounds in the first few weeks either. We will increase that for you as recovery continues to go well. Returning to work uh, is very dependent upon your job requirements. Some patients may return to work within four weeks and others won't be able to return to a few months. Uh, we will discuss this individually at your appointment. Please notify us if you have fever, drainage at the incision site, if you have new headaches or new symptoms that were not present prior to surgery. Preparing for surgery. Dr. Mather and or his highly trained staff is always available to assist with your questions or concerns. You can find that information on the website on how to contact us. You will have one last appointment prior to surgery. This is an appointment devoted to educating you with Dr. Mather and his nursing staff. We will provide further information about your specific surgery and recovery. This is the perfect appointment to bring your questions and your caregiver to. Surgery can be intimidating, so please let us know if we can assist you in any way on making this a smoother process. And for further information, please visit www.matherspinesurgery.com and then follow the links below.